Hi, everybody. It's Mary Rowe. Honestly, I just want to thank our producer, Wendy Rowland, for this beautiful music that she puts on. It's uh, fantastic for us to be able to benefit from just a little bit of peace and quiet. Here we are uh, heading into a long weekend. I hope it's a long weekend for most of you. It is for us here at CUI. So looking forward to a break. And as I know my colleagues are. So thank you for joining us uh, for a really uh, terrific gathering of folks as I say, on the edge of a long weekend, who are taking the time to be part of a discussion about why Main Streets matter. Um, I happen to be in Toronto today, as you can, well, you can't really see, but that's Toronto out there. And uh, uh, this is the traditional territory of, uh, well, as we know, in Canada, Inuit, uh, Métis and First Nations peoples. Uh, and we are very conscious of the extent to which urbanism has constrained um, the expression of ancestral rights. Uh, and how do we actually address that? So I call on all of us to try to be reflective about this. And particularly when you think about main streets uh, and the indigenous uh, experience of the gathering place. Um, Toronto happens to be the ancestral territory, traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, uh, the, uh, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples and home to many First Nations, as I mentioned. And we actually are, a tr we are actually uh, do have treaties uh, here uh, the Williams Treaty and Treaty 13, but we have people across the country, unceded territories, no treaties. So in that context of uh, uh, an awareness of, of where these lands actually, who actually are the stewards of these lands, who has been and who needs to be in the future and how we collectively uh, come to terms with that. So what an interesting way for us to think about our main streets. I was suggesting to somebody earlier this morning that, and I know people on this chat that, uh, you know, the, um, City Talk chat community has a life of its own, and uh, which you'll all prove to me today again, as usual, because you're going to have all sorts of interesting conversations happening in tandem to what we have online. But one of the things that uh, I have been reminded of is when you look at the public realm in any community, any city, and take the percentage of the publicly owned land that's actually a street, it's a lot. And someone on the chat is going to know exactly what it is, some percentage that's impressive. If you do know, put it on. Uh, because it is the, uh, we always say at CUI, we're about downtowns, the hearts and main streets, which are the connected tissue, the, the uh, um, uh, distribution system, the circulatory system of a city, and uh, how important these two units of analysis are. So here we are uh, to uh, talk to some folks specifically about why main streets matter and how investments in main streets can support resilience, uh, recovery, inclusion, equitable prosperity in local communities. And one of the things that I love about Main Streets is pretty much everybody knows where theirs is. And uh, and we define it differently. And the Main Street doesn't actually look the same in every community, but it works at all scales. So if you live in a, in a city like this, which is a couple million people, you still have a Main Street that you relate to or you're aware of, and you might visit somebody else's Main Street. And if you are in a small community of 800 people or 1500 people or a couple of thousand, you know where your main street is too. And it's a really useful exercise for us to try to ground ourselves in where we go for a sense of attachment, belonging, economic exchange, uh, meaning, uh, and all the things that attract us. And during the pandemic, we developed a different kind of relationship to our main street. And now as we continue to emerge and look at the implications of that, um, what does that mean for how we invest, how public policies are being shaped, how private investments being uh, directed, and how we all spend our own money? So uh, that's uh, the conversation for today is to talk about uh, what we're seeing. And specifically, we're going to start a little bit on uh, the My Main Street program because that is present this at this moment, this very moment in Southern Ontario. So I'm going to ask all our uh, panel gang to uh, put their cameras on so you can see them. And... Uh, and as you know, please feel free to uh, uh, pop a question into the chat. I know I can see people signing in from where they are. It's always helpful for us to see where people are coming in from. And if you've got specific topics or questions that you want this esteemed group of people to respond to, I'm sure they'll be happy to. So put it in the chat and uh, I'll make sure I direct it to them. Um, and for us to just remember uh, that the everything that you put in the chat, we publish. And these conversations uh, that we have now, uh, also will get posted in a couple of days. So if you uh, want to watch it again, you can. And if you want to um, uh, share it with friends and colleagues, you can do that too. So uh, as the uh, various uh, Hollywood squares start to size up in the screen here, um, we'll get a chance to, let's hear from Lindsay first, who is administering the My Main Street program, which is a program supported by the 
uh, Southern Ontario Federal Development, uh, Federal Economic Development Agency for Southern Ontario, which is the regional development agency for Southern Ontario, uh, Governor of Canada. And uh, she is, I can't believe she's vertical uh, because she is dealing with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of inquiries and applications. And it was a bit of a nasty thing that the deadline for my main street is this weekend, a long weekend. So no long weekend for the My Main Street staff. Sorry, Lindsay, but um, uh, the important thing about this, and just for the rest of the country who are listening, this is a pilot program in Southern Ontario. But as I say, the concept of Main Street, we all have one. And we all care, I hope, at least I'm sure people on this call will, care about what kinds of places we're making uh, so that we can actually have vibrant main streets. And all the folks that are on this call are engaged in that kind of work in some way. So, Lindsay, why don't you off the top just uh, orient people a little bit to what's happening with the My Main Street team, uh, and then we will have a chance to talk to our other folks who work in all sorts of different circumstances. Over to you, Lindsay. Thanks, Mary. Um, yeah, so it's a really exciting and very busy time in the program. Uh, we opened for applications for this round um, on February 22nd. And as Mary mentioned, we do close at the end of the month. Um, so on March 31st, we are very excited to be delivering another round of My Main Street programming. Um, as Mary mentioned, this is funded through FedDev Ontario. It's a $15 million investment. Um, 6.5 million of those dollars will be uh, funneled directly into the hands of small business owners across Southern Ontario. Um, 6.5 million also delivered to not-for-profit community organizations um, who will be taking on placemaking initiatives, again, across Southern Ontario. Um, so we're really excited to kind of see the program take shape this time around. We've had a fantastic amount of interest. Um, we're sitting over to, uh, 1,400 applications to the business sustainability stream. Um, so that would be sort of the, as I mentioned, the mechanism by which we are delivering funds to the small business owners across Ontario. Um, and we have about 100 applications to the Community Activator Program. Um, so we're very excited. We've been able to review some of these applications as, as we've seen them come through. A lot of really exciting projects um, that we are excited to kind of support and see realized um, through the support of our funding. So exciting times. Um, and our team is ready and at the at their keyboards to answer your questions. If you if you do have some, <laughs> there's a, a short window of time. Um, so please reach out to us if you do have interest or questions on the program. So just to be clear here, this is the you got three more days. I think the deadline is the 31st it is. Uh, of March. So in between whatever, uh, and I should acknowledge that this is a religious observance for a number of folks, uh, Ramadan and Easter. Uh, and uh, so uh, we appreciate that, as I say, the timing is not ideal, but uh, these deadlines get set by circumstances over which we have limited control. So, uh, but um, again, the idea that there are two different kinds of ways through the my through this this version of the my main street program two different kinds of ways lindsay to strengthen the main street one is to strengthen the businesses that operate on the main street and the other is to create activities and events and improvements and investments that bring more people to the main street so it's somehow people and commerce together huh it is. It's definitely sort of a, a cross section of those priorities um, and really with the concept that they build into one another. They're highly integrated. Um, and as much as we can sort of um, enhance both of those things at the same time, it really supports the initiatives and the priorities of, of both. So mm -hmm. they're highly interrelated. You know, I always remind people that Cities exist because of commercial life. You know, the reason cities formed up was because it was an opportunity to trade and exchange. And it was like, you know, if you think of the history of urban settlements of any kind, settlements, even small settlements, you came to ex trade goods or exchange goods. It was a commercial uh, uh, impetus that brought uh, communities and cities together. So this marrying of economic opportunity, and we know that 70% of the country is employed in a small or medium enterprise. And of that, 
large percentage are on main streets. And we also know that almost 80% of Canadians live within 500 or 600 meters of the main street. They can walk to it if they had, if they, if they were able to. So this idea of it being a kind of a uh, piece of critical infrastructure, economic infrastructure, but also social infrastructure, uh, which is why this program is so interesting. And we've got three folks here that are very specific, have very specific knowledge of uh, this effort to try to do both people and commercial life in uh, through the My Main Street program. Omer, you're now in a new incarnation, but I'm going to go to you first uh, to just talk a little bit about from your perspective and in your current role. So maybe you could explain your history with this, but also what you're doing now. Uh, and, then I, and then I'll go from you to Sonia, Jeanette, and then uh, the gentlemen, uh, the two esteemed architect planners will come in and uh, provide some overview of their perspective and their uh, when they work around in different jurisdictions. So Omar, first to you, and then I say Jeanette and Sonia. Thank you so much, Mary and Lindsay. Hi, everyone. My name is Omar Ishmael. I'm an economic development officer at the city of Toronto. Um, a lot of what I'm hearing- You weren't always me. Omar. You weren't always- yeah. Absolutely. A lot of what I'm hearing is bringing me flashbacks to my time at my Main Street, actually, just not too long ago, where I was involved with the local business accelerator, which has transformed into a new and improved um, you know, iteration of supports being provided to small businesses um, that Lindsay has mentioned. But yeah, the work of Main Streets is incredibly um, uh, important and relevant to me. I've been spending the last few years since the pandemic directly focus on that work. Um, and, you know, each year I feel like I'm learning more and more about the different ways Main Streets provide value and the different ways we can support them. So happy to be part of this call and looking forward to sharing more and learning more. I'm interested, Omer, from your perspective, when you look at what's going on in Main Streets in Toronto and, mm -hmm. um, in this case, my Main Street last year, or last iteration didn't include Toronto, but now it does. Um, what are you seeing? Do, 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 remember, you've got listeners here from all across the province and all across the country. We've got some Americans on. Welcome, Americans. Always like having Americans. Uh, what are you seeing? T just paint a bit of a picture of what you think the challenges are to Main Streets right now. Yeah, it's an interesting thing because, um, you know, I feel like we all look at it through the lens of um, since COVID, and I've even referenced it in my introduction, um, but I think there's an interesting lens to consider of the value, one that you kind of referenced, Mary, of the value that Main Streets bring um, and how they shape cities, and sometimes cities are formed around um, the commerce that individual uh, Main Streets provide to its residents and surrounding residents. Um, but the main streets across the province and likely Canada have been experiencing a lot of challenges that they've learned to find ways to adapt through, whether it be technological challenges, challenges around accessing new ways of, you know, selling and uh, providing services to their customers, whether it be through technology or otherwise. Um, and then other challenges, you know, that varies. And I feel like it can go on forever on that. But I think the interesting thing is that, you know, now the challenge that we're, we're all really spending a lot more energy on is how to, you know, really come back to the main streets as, you know, we once seen the value of, but in the pandemic specifically provided a new lens of ideas and ways that people can engage with main streets, shop locally, support businesses, learn about the businesses in their neighborhood. And it, it really provided that hyper-local lens of the small business and the areas that they uh, are, are, are part of, whether they be BIAs or et cetera. So um, I think, you know, what I'm noticing since I've, you know, had my experience with my Main Street, but also what I'm seeing specifically in the city of Toronto um, is there's a diverse need based on the business makeup, the community's makeup, the part of the city that the Main Streets have for supports, guidance, and also the value that they can bring. Um, and I think the most important thing that I've been seeing in my short term at the city of Toronto, just a few months now, has been, you know, the the range of ways of addressing those needs. So um, my role at the city is uh, part of this larger initiative called the, um, the Main Street Recovery Rebuild Initiative, which mm -hmm. is also, as uh, Mary mentioned, funded by uh, the Federal Economic Development Agency for Southern Ontario. Um, and we are looking at funding and supporting Main Streets and businesses through many different lenses. So under that MRRI um, program, uh, there are actually seven other programs that support and serve Main Streets and their businesses in different ways. Well, one would be the Cafe TO Property Improvement Program, um, which supports many businesses in expanding their um, you know, patio and service offerings onto curbside opportunities for small businesses, as well as the Main Street Innovation Fund, which is once again, coming up with new ways of piling the challenges that mm -hmm. the local Main Street in one area of the city may face 
while it's entirely you know one one area next to it may be experiencing a different challenge but looking to pilot a different uh project as well so you know i think the challenge is that i think the the one that i really highlight is the diversity of uh, needs um, based on regions community makeup business makeup and what those neighborhoods are really known for mm -hmm. yeah you know um, again i'd encourage people to put into the chat what are you seeing on your main street and just a, a, a heads up, if you're an applicant to My Main Street uh, and you've got a particular question, go to the My Main Street website. Uh, there are FAQs there. There's a whole bunch of places and initiate a conversation directly with My Main Street because I'm concerned that we won't hear or have the right technical information to respond to you. So if you've got a very specific question, Lindsay can try to respond in the chat, but uh, she's got a whole team of folks that are Operators are standing by, you know, who will be able to give you very specific information about uh, clarity about what it is you're applying for and, and whether or not you're eligible and all that kind of stuff. Um, thanks, Omar. I think the point you're making, which is really valuable, is that even though we may all have a main street, mm -hmm. they don't they're not all actually the same. They don't have they all have different kinds of cert of, of challenges and they have a different uh, market uh, uh, reach. Right. And we noticed we did uh, some of you will remember. In the early days of the pandemic, CUI started something called Bring Back Main Street, and we did mm. some block studies to see who was, this is 2021, and we looked to see which Main Street businesses were doing better. And what we found were that the Main Street businesses that had a very dedicated local clientele, they were, they, they, you know, you could walk. Uh, I mean, we've all got stories about this where you suddenly you established a much closer relationship with a vendor that was a block or two from you and that you could safely go and make a purchase or you might have made a purchase online, but you go pick it up. That's what I do with my bookstore. I order online, then I walk to the bookstore. So we know that there were examples of that, that it strengthened it. We also know, though, that there can be on main streets a unique businesses that do attract people from other places and they come specifically for a particular kind of service. So this idea of a really embedded local market that comes to you regularly. And then the other is, or you have a highly specialized product and you cultivate folks uh, to know about you and come uh, at a distance. And I shared an anecdote last week or two weeks ago on one of these about um, a store in Ottawa that uh, a clothing store, I went in, didn't see what I wanted, went online, saw what I wanted. And then they said, yeah, just let us know and we will, we will bring it into the store. So this new relationship that's evolving between yeah. online and bricks and mortar, and that we don't have to sacrifice one for the other. We can somehow have a combination. Jeanette, let's go to you now. Uh, you've got, again, a wide, I've just, I was just in your hometown. I was in London earlier this week, uh, talking to all sorts of folks about Main Street businesses and the economy mm -hmm. in London. Yeah, and well. And uh, so, I, so your name was taken never in vain uh, a few times, but uh, but why don't you tell people where you're at and how you're engaging now and a little bit about your history and then tell us what you're seeing in terms of the main streets that you're talking to. Okay, well, I, I come from a very different background than Omar, but hi, Omar. Nice to see you again. Um, I was 17 years in the downtown London BIA, so that's where I get most of my knowledge about main street businesses and challenges and, you know, how cities you know, plan their downtown, invest in their downtown and what the outcomes are. And just to quickly speak about investment in downtowns, like it's something cities cannot stop doing is investing in their main streets and their downtowns. It's kind of like your, your adult child who's going to stay at home with you and never leave. You have to keep taking care of them. And if you keep feeding the golden goose, the golden goose is going to keep laying eggs. Because generally speaking, your, your main street is in the highest tax bracket in the city or the highest mill rate in the city. And if they can afford to pay their taxes, it benefits the rest of the city. And that's that's something that councils need to be taking a look at when they're they're looking at budgets for downtowns. Um, capital investments are fantastic, lots of them in London, but we need operating and maintenance budgets to go with them. You can't just you know make the baby and then let the baby you know deal for itself. But basically, small businesses what like it's been my passion for a long, long time. Even previous to being in downtown London, I was an, a banker. And I love dealing with small businesses and being able to help them grow their business. So I understand it from very, very many aspects. And most recently, well, in 2021, I was the community manager for the first iteration of the My Main Street Community Activator and really enjoyed myself speaking with my colleagues all over Southern Ontario. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. But since then, I'm now a hired gun, I guess. I, I work for a company called MyConnects who issues uh, downtown gift cards. And it's a, actually a local currency. It's a private label, uh, closed-looped Visa gift card that can only be redeemed within your community. So 
lots of places in Ontario have them. Lots of places all over the UK, uh, Ireland, Canada, and the United States have this program now. We have over 220 live programs. And it's really wonderful because you can measure the success of the program. You have real-time redemption information plus overspend information. So you can actually measure the amount of money that's going into your economy. And it really helps the small businesses because let's face it, they're the first ones to suffer when anything happens like a pandemic and it takes them a lot longer to, to recover. So anything we can do to put, as we used to say in BIA land, you know, feet on the street, bums in seats and money in the tills. And that's precisely what these, these, uh, this local currency does. But, you know, beyond that, I'm also working for a company called Live, Work, Learn, Play. And we're doing a really interesting, for me, it's feeding my soul, some downtown revitalization work in St. Thomas, the city Mary was referring to, but the Volkswagen uh, battery plant going there. And we're actually working for a private developer right now, but we're really hoping it's going to come in to be a secondary plan for St. Thomas so that they're ready for the, um, the influx of employees and residents that are going to come into that area. And are we ready to give them places to go and gather and, you know, meet each other on a Saturday? You know, besides the market and a couple of coffee shops, there needs to be a lot more public space. And when the public space is well maintained and kept clean and, you know, clean and uh, clean and safe, more people will go there. And I think people economically, small businesses make up such a huge part of our economy, but emotionally, the, the ties that we have to those local local businesses, like I'd never go downtown without visiting a few of my favorite, but I'm not going to mention them because I'm going to create favorites. And I, I, I still get accused of that. You've, but anyway. take, you've taken me to them. I know the story. Yeah, I've taken you. Yeah, I've taken you to them. And you always, you always find out who's, you know, who has the good coffee and who has the free wine. But that's part of the experience is you is it's not a transaction. It's absolutely an experience. And it's a relationship you build. And that is sadly lacking these days in the online shopping world and the work at home like you know we really need to get people back in the office so that they, that clientele can return mm -hmm. and uh it's interesting the point you're making around that that the the micronext the company that you work for uh yeah. is about creating a, a very easy way to get money to circulate locally so you yeah. drop it locally and then it recirculates locally and i think this is a lot of people in the chat are saying that how do we actually pull money down and keep it circulating and that's one mechanism yep. that's available to you. Jeanette, in terms of what you're observing, any any changes that you're seeing in the Main Street dynamic uh, in, in the first part of 2024, anything that we need to be paying attention to that's different? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, this has always been ongoing, but it's, it's gonna be ongoing for a long time is the, the, the growth of the homeless population mm -hmm. on the streets. And I see a lot of people with their doors locked. And we never saw that before. Not the in business, the, the yeah. business doors Businesses locked. have their doors locked. Yeah. So you have yeah. to either ring a bell or bang on the door to get in. And that that really create that really creates a barrier. That creates friction to go into a store. Because if you're yeah. banging in the door and nobody answers, are they open? Are they closed? You know, so you don't really know what's going on. Um and 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 some small businesses they, they might very well be closed and you they don't really keep regular hours. So you know, like meet is all halfway open like during a business day and you know, like stay open. We yeah. have a fabulous antique store in London, and it was like four stories high, some of the best antiques you could ever see. And it was never open. It yeah. was almost like a hobby. So, that, I mean, that makes it really difficult for people yeah. to trust in the downtown. That's where the malls have it over the, you know, the small business areas is they can, they open at 10 and they close at six or whatever the regular hours are, and they can mandate that. You can't mandate a small business to stay open. Well, but I mean, that's good, what yeah. I mean, that's one of yeah. the things we like about it is that we don't, we're not yeah. the boss of Main Street, but I hear right. you. We've got to encourage yeah. people to go in. Listen, yeah. I just want to thank all the people who are chiming in on the chat. And I see some of our colleagues, like, hi, Amy, who's uh, here from uh, BC Local. Um, great to have people from across the country. Can I ask you when you're making your comments to double check to make sure you're saying it to everyone? Uh, so, Amy, you've posted something about Vancouver, but it's only gone to host some panelists. Can you re repost so everybody gets to see what you're observing in Vancouver? And uh, I think the important thing is that we're starting to see all these other economic pressures, interest mm -hmm. rates, labor demands, shortage of staff, um, uh, different kinds of regulatory requirements. You know, you can sort of it's as if we all woke up. And everybody's suddenly putting new rules in in new places, and now it's got to, the patio has to look like that, and the, and it is a very chaotic environment. So again, mm -hmm. it's back to the challenges that we all experience, 
uh, in terms of you want to have a some kind of a regularized environment, just as you were suggesting, Jeanette. We want to know yeah. when it's open and when they don't. But at the same time, we don't want to dampen the kind of sort of unusual, unique features that we see. And that's one of the challenges. Sonia, I'm going to come to you next with the beautiful backdrop. Again, somebody who's got long experience with the My Main Street program and now in a different role. Tell us a little bit about Unionville and what you're seeing on your Main Street. We actually did the launch in Unionville. You were on a couple of months ago talking about that. So tell us what you're seeing in terms of the changes on Main Street. Hello, everyone. My name is Sonia Chow. I'm the executive director uh, at the Unionville Business Improvement Area. And um, prior to this position, I was with the my Main Street program, served as the um, ambassador for two local um, business areas in uh, Markham, Ontario. Um, so these two businesses area, two business areas are really different. Um, one is more for Chinese community or Asian community, and then for the um, for the Main Street Unionville is more a historic um, district where um, we have different um, visitors or local residents shop uh, to our Main Street during the week and the weekend. So. Um, um, it's, it's a really challenging um, Main Street to manage, just like other Main Street, I, I would say. Um, we found uh, we have limited foot traffic and then um, maybe the parking constraints and also high turnover rate of businesses um, right after pandemic because um, people may um, shop uh, online and then um, the business owner also face different challenges when they operate their business with or just on their own. Um, and then um, they try to um, have their business with um, that can able to shop locally, but at the same time attract um, visitors um, away from our, our communities to, to come. So, um, but I do think um, Main Street businesses is a backbone for the community that uh, people will um, gather and then um, share um, their experiences all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is the challenge that you've got. And in you, you've got an interesting uh, particular situation in Univo where you have a historic downtown, yeah. uh, which is which has a certain kind of look to it. Uh, which is very appealing, but you've also got other main streets uh, in the Unionville Markham area that that have a different history. And so, how do you find there, as as was being suggested uh, by Omer, are the needs that different, Sonia, in terms of what these streets need? I, I would say yes. Every main street is unique. Um, for Main Street Unionville, it's actually located like the, the central uh, of city of Markham. Mm -hmm. in Markham. So um, we found um, we have like uh, our historical, um, like the uh, go train station there. And then um, the street is more like um, the historic um, resident houses. Yeah. Um, so people may look for something different um, to Main Street Unionville to other um, Main Street or other shopping mall. And then um, our residents, went, went, we did a, a couple of um, surveys asking their expectations from our residents. So they are expecting like uh, more events and then um, like um, accessible um, parking or how they can come easily, uh, like increasing the foot traffic, something like that. So I, I would say um, our Main Street had some, something really different that uh, people are expecting differently, not just shop local, but also during um, the weekends, they love to come um, to enjoy the summer um, and attend any um, festival or or, or any um, events on the street. But at the same time, we, we have a micro street. We Every time when we organize event, we want to close the street, but we um, we, we found um, there is like high road closure cost that we, we need to comply um, in order to make sure the safety and everything on the street. Yeah, I mean, I'm seeing people in the chat commenting about this public safety piece. This is really critical that it's a deterrent. Uh, we really have that in terms of downtowns, the main streets, downtowns, people are concerned. Um, 
that they don't feel safe. Uh, and so I'm going to ask Adam and Dorian to come on uh, together because they both work in a professional capacity around the built environment. And what we're, it's interesting in the chat also, and Sonia just mentioned it, uh, transit investments, guys. So I'm, I, you both are professionals mm -hmm. working in this field. And we know that we're spending enormous amounts of infrastructure money around cities around North America. And both of you work in Canada and in the US. Um, and we're investing in transit hubs and we're investing in these. And do we have a kind of the right kind of integrated strategy to make sure that if you in do those huge investments that you maintain the fine grain independent business mix, or as some people are flagging in the chat, if a, if a main street gets redeveloped, then, and there's housing put on it, for instance, multi-unit housing, invariably we seem to lose the independent mom and pop shops and we seem to get either vacant, empty ground floors or mm -hmm. get a chain. Yeah. So Adam, do you want to start? And then Dorian, uh, really glad to have both of you on and interested in your perspectives. Yeah, absolutely. Great to be here um, as the resident New Yorker on board. But we do now have a small office in, um, in Toronto. Um, so I think what you're describing is a um, situation that's coming up a lot in New York and uh, other cities where... Um, there are instances of light rail extensions being planned. You know, New York has a subway that's being extended and they're being coupled with rezonings. And so they're looking at creating more density, which I think, uh, you know, on a basic level can be great for main streets. And we've gotten involved in a number of instances in that rezoning. We've been working on the kind of regulatory side of like, you know, how can we trying to build into policy ways of um, ensuring that you have small and potentially independent businesses. So there are some great examples from New York, including one that I worked on in East Harlem, New York, um, where we were prescribing the size of commercial units. And so that's been, there's been a big effort over the last 10 years or so in New York, starting in the Upper West Side, um, where really trying to, keep out in New York, the big challenge has been large banks, um, real, large real estate agents occupying ground floor space or pharmacies, and really trying to ensure that the, the commercial units uh, stay small. So that I'll just lead with that. But there are a number of other instances where if there's redevelopment that's tied to uh, transportation in, investment, you can find ways of, of addressing it. I mean, I have such ambivalence about this because, of course, we all want banks and we we want to have financial services available to residents. And whether you're a business customer or a residential customer, you want. And, and I'm sad to see banks leaving main streets because I feel like it it's like a post office. It was a place where you would have some kind of relationship. And now we just go to the ATM, take our cash or whatever. And I so I, I want banks to stay on main streets. But at the same time, as you suggest, if they go into those new developments and they're the only tenant that can afford whatever yeah. the rent is, and invariably it's a lot of square footage with not much activity. So when you say you're prescribing smaller spaces, Adam, are you actually, you're saying the only way to deter large sort of chains going in is to actually have some kind of zoning restrictions so that you just, they just can't get that space. Is it, is it effective to do that? It's not keeping out the types of businesses. It's just constraining the the floor plate size or the footprint. And so, you know, trying to prevent, you know, they'll take, you know, 200 feet on a block or 150 right. feet they'll on a kill, block. They can kill you know. a block. That's right. And so it's it's really about the size. It's not to say we don't want banks. It's just we don't want that size of a commercial unit. Um, and. Yeah, another. Well, I'll I'll jump in with more comments, but there's there are a couple other interesting facets. I'll well, come back to you, Dorian. Let's you jump in too, and then I'm going to ask everybody if we can uh, put everybody on the Hollywood Squares view so everybody can be seen. Dorian, what's your perspective? I know you work between Windsor and Detroit, uh, and you're a, a fellow with CUI, so we appreciate your expertise mm -hmm. always. What's your view? Yeah, thanks, Mary. The, the way I look at it, similar to what Adam was saying, is that one of the key factors in the main street is the size of the spaces that businesses need to locate in. And from that standpoint, the smaller the spaces, the easier it is to get local entrepreneurs involved in main street, which from the standpoint of hyper-local activity, 
and addressing the cons consumer's needs, I think it, that's kind of the, the critical thing that we need to take a look at when we're looking at revitalizing these main streets. But also what I've seen in my travels around different cities and in some of the work that we've done is that there's kind of four key areas that I think need to be addressed for the resiliency of main streets. The first are the buildings. And quite often, especially in smaller towns, you have historic or heritage structures in those cities that need to be uh, addressed, rehabbed, and you know, and quite often in a lot of cases saved from the wrecking ball. You have to understand those things are assets, one. Uh, the second thing that I think is an important thing to consider is, is public space. We talked about the street as the primary public space and attention needs to be given mm -hmm. to that but attention also needs to be given to uh, what I what I think three kinds of public space: active, passive, and hybrid. You know, parks, playgrounds, and plazas. Mm -hmm. How they those public spaces that we've seen that are important uh, during COVID, we understand the importance of those. But those can also help to become attractors for people to main streets. And then there are two other things I think that are important. One is mobility. And I think quite often we get uh, we get concerned with how people are going to visit Main Street by car, but we've transitioned into a number of other uh, viable transportation modes. And that being, you know, bicycling, uh, we've got uh, ride share, we've got all different modes. So we have to address the mobility through the Main Street area. And then finally, the connectivity between Main Street and its surroundings. How do you make it easy to mm -hmm. access Main Street uh, Main Street from the community, the neighborhoods that surround it? And how does it connect to other Main Streets within the area? Yeah, I mean, it's almost by definition, a Main Street is a connector. It, it is a, con I mean, I think I like that, that there's, by definition, a main street implies it's not a dead end. It's a connection to something else. Could I ask Wendy to put everybody up on so I, we can see everybody and have our usual city talk bun fight so that everybody is uh, everybody's face is on the camera or whatever that expression is, everybody's face is on the screen. Uh, because we're getting lots of questions in the chat and I want us to all feel free to just chime in on this. One of them is uh, a question around equity. Uh, are, how do we make main streets, how do we ensure that main streets actually boost equity. I'll throw one idea out and then I wanna hear other people suggest this, but if you have activities on a main street that attract a diversity of user and, it, and, and they somehow appeal to different kinds of folks, does that make it a more equitable main street? Those of you that are building these streets, tell me, can we boost equity through main streets? I think absolutely. Like we have a lot of cultural organizations within our, our cities and our towns. And, you know, if you have a, if a BIA, for example, it's a, they're a great channel for all of these activities. If they have a decent budget, they can certainly attract a lot of different activities that promote, you know, the, the, the equity that we're seeking. We have a lot of businesses in London that are owned by all walks of life. And, you know, we have, we have the great main street in Dundas place, which is a, an event space. Now it can be shut down for events. And, you know, Friday nights outside of an El Salvadorian restaurant, they have salsa dancing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, that's the type of thing we need. And we need people to like come and enjoy and embrace those different activities and, and you know, the, and not just think about what you always do, you know, mm -hmm. which is not very fun to me in some but I, cases. But, but I guess one of the questions would be, is yeah. there a way to have enough of a diversity of mix of businesses and services and activities on the main street that everyone feels welcome? I, th I just feel like people might feel that street's not for me. Omer, what do you, what's your experience of that? Because Toronto has enormous diversity of, of, of a population. H how do you actually, what steps can you take as a municipal government to make sure that streets feel equitable and they're accessible for everyone? Absolutely. Yeah. There's a interesting thing in Toronto where you see certain main streets and certain communities and geographies in the city um, really form sometimes uh, based on the migration and, and, and cultural connection that individuals have when they move to Canada. And obviously it leads to the creation of like areas like Little Italy, 
um, and in many other areas of like Chinatown in, in, in the downtown core, but also growingly like little Jamaica on Eglinton West, um, there's these communities that are really entrenched in the idea of the culture in which they brought to Canada. And it provides unique value to the city and also those that visit the city and their prospective businesses within those areas. But on the flip side, you know, as changes happen, when these when we're decades now away or multiple decades away from the time in which this mass inflow of newcomers to Canada has come to that shape this community, those communities also change, whether it be due to right. um, rising costs of, you know, um, housing or um, real estate as a whole for commercial businesses uh, or commercial properties for businesses. And there are investments that are also a consideration that need to be made to ensure that those communities um, still retain, one, their um, that historic cultural connection um, to the businesses that they pro provide unique services from those communities. But also we see those same things happening in areas where, you know, there's maybe not a diverse retail mix of, of, of different types of products or services provided within a specific BA or whatever it may be. And there is that need to also consider what, um, you know, can be done to in bring net new businesses to those communities as well, whether these be through uh, programs that make it a little more accessible to um, uh, uh, improve a, a vacant property that can be repurposed for a new entrepreneur or a business looking to expand into no location a location that they previously really weren't familiar with, moving from one area to another. Those are those mm -hmm. considerations there. So it's not always financial. Um, I think the other part is, um, you know, the comfort of a business uh, owner itself, um, knowing their market and where their market likes to shop and going there. Um, and I think there's another thing to consider around what access to information uh, may be available to better understand the neighborhoods that uh, a business can maybe set up shop. So, um, yeah, there's a number what, of what the, what the consumers want. You mean? Yeah. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. Keep going. I cut you off. Yeah. Keep going. No, no worries. But the, there's a number of programs that kind of speak to how that can happen um, that the city currently operates. And, you know, I think for me, you know, one of the things we're also seeing um, is, and I'm seeing in the chat extensively, um, the number of construction projects that are happening across the province. Um, these uh, In Toronto, we have um, some uh, multi-year construction programs that are, you know, impacting certain communities and businesses are seeing, um, you know, some vacancies increase over the, after the pandemic, when they're thinking that they're just sure. over the hump. Um, so, you know, th their consideration there is like, what can be done to help support those business communities, those BIAs and those the businesses that really make up that area. Um, and one of the grant programs that we currently provide is a construction mitigation grant program uh, that really provides funding to small businesses, not for profit, uh, sorry, um, not for profits and BIAs to really address the challenges and, and attract new people to those areas and, and get visitation to those areas, despite the, the, the maybe some of the various access to transportation that maybe that construction project has had. Um, but there are a variety of challenges. Yeah. It's so hard eh, because we know we want those investments. I was thinking yeah. that the day when I was lumbering along a main artery here and, you know, very slow. And I'm thinking everybody hates this, but, you know, you're investing in the future. That's why the traffic is congested because mm -hmm. you're actually building bike lanes and you're building housing. I'm interested to hear from just the gang, uh, all of you again, and maybe I'm going to go to Dorian and Adam for a second, the gentrification, the big G word, you know, as we, and in Canada, Adam, for your benefit, the discussion about more housing units is completely dominating the public discourse now. It's all that's being talked about, every provincial budget, the federal budget, it's all going to be about that. And the dilemma is that as you create more units, you in, you in essence start to gentrify that neighborhood that the units are being created in and you force out the cheaper rent small businesses. So what I, I'm wondering whether we have to get really radical about this and have a new tax class for independent owned businesses so otherwise we will we will not keep that we won't have those economic opportunities we won't have those places for newcomers to set up businesses and for us to be able to patronize because they'll get forced out by all the money that's being poured into either new transit infrastructure or new housing infrastructure so how do we stop that the negative side of that wall of money Adam and then Dorian. Yeah, I mean, um, 
some of this really falls into kind of governance and management territory, which I can speak to a bit, but but it it's not all a design or planning question. And I think there are opportunities for uh, commercial community land trusts to occupy ground floor spaces okay. Okay. Uh, for bids to um, be kind of master lessees where they may have uh, you know, a lease on, on a large number of ground floor spaces and they really curate those spaces. And so they can be the kind of broker uh, between, and we've seen some of that in downtown Brooklyn, you know, between um, you know, landowners, landlords and, and, and new businesses. So I think there are some interesting models to do that. And then I think um, it's to continue to promote some of the things that, that we learned during COVID, but do that in a, in a really accessible way. You know, one thing I did want to mention relative to the previous comment, co commentary about equity is the restaurants that popped up on street um, right now in New York City. We're going through a big process. Our firm, WXY, design prototypes and the new guidelines for those but there is a concern that like with regulation of those we're going to lose those we've had 13,000 of those uh in New York City and so really ensuring and it's employed so many people you know ensuring that you're doing um those kinds of programs in an accessible way that you're not over regulating them is going to be important to keeping uh, streets lively. Um, so I think it's really a combination of how you're managing um, some of these ground floor units and then how you're designing and regulating the street space as well. I, I'm uh, all the municipal staff on the uh, chat are going to go crazy now about the idea of overregulation. I, you know, we can all <laughs> see it. We can all see that is happening. Uh, and suddenly now, you know, we during the pandemic, we all improvised and we tolerated all sorts of experiments. And now we're back to rules and how long it takes. And it's it's one of the interesting things about why it's so important uh, to hang on to a business, uh, because. If they go under, it's extraordinarily time consuming to try to replace that business. Dorian, what's your view on this about the gentrification question? And how do we, is it about curating main streets? Is it about a different tax class? Is it about community land trusts? What's it about? Well, I, I guess what I would say is that it it's about, and I'll build on what Adam was, was saying, it, it's about strategic planning in my mind in order to counteract the gentr gentrification problem. One of the things that's happening, as you know, in, in Ontario with the the push towards more density is uh, it's coming up against the market, which the market breeds sameness. That's why in Toronto, you're seeing all of the same kinds of right. towers. Right. And so what we need from the from the, the government is the planning side of it, not necessarily the taxing side, because you never know what happens when you, you place additional taxes or change tax um, structures. But from the government side, where from and housing, where do we place housing? How do we provide incentives to locate the kinds of affordable housing that we need in specific areas? Yeah. And, and the businesses to support them. Right. And I was going to say, and that drives the demand for businesses that cater to those individuals, as opposed to the way that it happens now in a city like Toronto, where because of the development model, the only rational retailer is Shopper, Shopper's Drug Mart. Yeah. <laughs> and for those of you in the US, that's CVS or Rite Aid or Walgreens. And, and, and so we have to, from the government standpoint, is really enact some very strategic planning moves to sort of get things working and, and create that yeah. demand that solidifies Main Street. But, you know, the downside, I mean, you know, we don't want to call out an individual companies, but I mean, there's no question that Shoppers Drug Mart and the banks are all the ones that are the ones that the culprits. But at the same time, it may be the place where you can get a quart of milk uh, or you can get, uh, you know, a banana. And that's the dilemma that we often have, too, is that uh, a lot of these places are food deserts. There aren't actually... Uh, uh, because the grocery chains, the way Canada's organized, they're in big, big stores, not so much in yeah. small stores. So I think we always have to balance this, right? Yeah. Lindsay, yeah, you, yeah. I've been giving Lindsay a bit of a break because I know that she's having to respond to people on the chat. But Lindsay, any perspectives from your point of view in terms of administering the two sides of the program? What have you been hearing as people have been calling you saying they want to apply? 
No, it has really run the gamut. Um, some very specific questions on process, of course, we want to have applicants be as successful as possible. So uh, walking them through the process um, as closely as we can. Um, but really, I mean, they're interested to know what types of projects we've funded in the past, how that can inspire their own ideas in their own neighborhoods, um, how it can kind of inform what, what sorts of projects might be possible. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's been such a variety, it's hard to kind of say. And because we're spanning such a large area, these are very regionally specific questions, um, challenges that people are experiencing in rural areas versus urban areas are very specific and different. Um, so let's, you know, let's, let's talk for a sec about the rural. Jeanette, you live yeah. rural now, don't you? I do, yes I do, I'm so in Kamoka, you, Ontario. <laughs> right. So you're seeing in smaller communities, this is why we love the Main Street notion, because even in a mm -hmm. small community like Kamoka, they know. Are there different, what, what Lindsay was just hinting at, are there different challenges in those rural communities that are on their Main Streets, or are they similar to what they're experiencing in the bigger cities? Very similar to what they're experiencing in the bigger cities. We're fortunate here in Kamoka. We have, an, we, we don't have to go outside of Kamoka to live. You know, we have the we have the essentials. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a lot of small independent businesses here, though, and that's really what we're lacking. We're lacking that sense of community and that sense of like a, the identity. You, you know, drop somebody in Kamoka, um, leave them for twenty minutes. They may not know where they are because there's nothing to uh, there's nothing to identify Kamoka unless you you're at the provincial oh. park. You right. know, so but places like around us, like you know Strathroy and Mount Bridges, have great little main streets. We just haven't built it here yet. But yeah, we do have a lot of the similar challenges. Like we can get milk, we can get wine. We've got an LCBO, it's a great store. But, um, <laughs> you know, you can you can get all of that, but you can't get the relationship. You can't get a little, there's no little coffee shops. We can go right. and take your laptop and, you know, talk to the barista and get a couple of cups of coffee and get some work done. There's but nothing isn't, like that. But isn't yeah. one of the things, I hope we'll see people proposing this uh, through my main street or just as we, you know, CUI will be about main streets as long as we can be, believe me, not yep. we will outlive this program too. But but uh, could we see more chances where we can use spaces for more than one thing? So can we get a coffee shop into, mm -hmm. uh, somebody made some comment about real estate developers. And I was uh, in North Toronto yesterday and uh, there where I was visiting my vet which is on a main street, hurrah, hurrah. Mm -hmm. And two yeah. doors down, there's a real estate brokerage and they've put a coffee shop in the brokerage. And it says, yeah. I've got a little yeah. sandwich board there saying, what better thing to do than come and talk to a realtor while you have a coffee? Yeah. It's kind of bizarre, really. But but this idea that we could put more than one thing in the yeah. space. Sonia, in Unionville, is that possible to see some co-locations to have a little bit of a surprise that maybe you use a space for more than one thing possible yeah i think possible because uh, one of uh, some of our uh, like the resident houses can now be commercial use they have like two store yeah. uh, like two levels so um we can definitely use uh, for multiple use while another challenge is how to promote that because yeah. many of the the visitors they just walk along the streets they won't they, they don't never, know they don't yeah. know yeah and then uh, we have also other challenge to put the sandwich board um, on the street that yeah. uh, because um, we need like permit or, or, or even change it by law Oh so my God, you need to get a bylaw change to put some, <laughs> to put a sandwich board on this. Yeah, yeah because yeah. we are we are operating uh, historic streets. So these are the challenge that um not not just the BIA but the businesses focus like uh, facing the the challenges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing uh, that we've been exploring is not just combining different kind of uses, but also to have uh, maker spaces, which have yeah. almost like a front of house retail. So some of that is some of those maker spaces have not been allowed on main streets because they were seen as manufacturing, but they're really just light industrial. So mm -hmm. that's been something that can also make main streets really dynamic is like people are making things in those spaces and then selling some of those goods there as well back to the you know how do we are there some rules we could take down and are there some incentives we could provide back so yep. let's d reduce some of the rules that prohibit uses mm -hmm. and then think a little bit about how we can invest differently a suggestion adam you put into the, the chat here that in new york if you're the city will bonus a developer if they'll put a fresh food uh, outlet in the main floor of their building. We need to think really imaginatively about this, guys. 
what can we do as Main Streets redevelop to incentivize really useful uh, uh, businesses, uh, mm -hmm. ideally independently owned on the main floors, and that we have more agency on that. We're all three minutes out. Uh, we pride ourselves ending on time here. So last words, I'll just go quickly around, ask each of you in terms of the challenge you see right now and what you would say to the audience in terms of how they can strengthen the collective capacity of their main streets around equity and resilience and economic opportunity. Omer, you first. Yeah, it's a good one. Um... I'm sure that by the end of this, I'll have a different answer that comes to mind and I'll regret not saying it. But I think the big piece as individuals on this call, take time to explore new neighborhoods, uh, whether they be in near proximity um, to of your home or elsewhere, um, to really find out where you can shop local to buy the products, produce, services that you need. Um, more and more, I feel like the, the question is, yes, I can do it online, but wouldn't it be better if I can do it nearby? Um, so that's just one part. There's a little small personal call to action. That's great. One from you, Lindsay, one thing. Yeah, so I would, you know what, speaking kind of to the small businesses and organizations that we have in our Main Street communities, lean into the resources that are available to you. Um, you know, your local BIAs, your small business centers, these are places that are ready and, you know, enthusiastic about helping you and um, showing you sort of what what can be available, uh, what can be possible, and sort of walking you through uh, the process as well. So they're a fantastic asset for those areas that have them available to them. Dorian. In, uh, incentivize the training of small business entrepreneurs to inhabit some of these, these spaces and so that everything becomes rather local and, and familiar, creating an identity for the Main Street. Mm, training. That's interesting. Right. Okay. Sonia. Yeah, I would say uh, understand your stakeholders and um, having the um, community engagement to success. Right. Jeanette. Well, obviously, I'm going to plug the, the local currency program, but it's a wonderful way to, to, to take shop local and actually deliver the local spend. And if you can encourage larger employers in the neighborhoods that have the, the, the program to use that for incentives for their staff, it keeps the money local. And it invests in the community where they've chosen to do business and they can be a community champion. And there's no better way, you know, to, to spend money locally. And it's very inclusive for every type of business. So keep the money yeah. local. Last yeah. word to New Keeping York City. Adam. All right. So I would say it's been well documented that public investment in the public realm sparks far more private investment. So I would put public money into making streets feel like public space. So they integrate ways of dealing with rainwater through rain gardens, on-street restaurants, um, you know, public parklets, um, dealing with waste issues. Like we need streets to be seen through a totally different lens that will support main streets. That's what I would I would put money toward. You guys are great. I want to spend all afternoon with you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And everybody, go out, spend some money on your main street. Go hang out. Go have a nice time. Talk to your neighbors. Invest in your in uh, the businesses that are there and make something fabulous happen. And if you're applying to My Main Street, March 31st, it's soon. And if you don't have a My Main Street funded program, go to your local MP or MPPs and say, we need My Main Street here. And let's make this work across the country because it's all about our streets and our people. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Great to have you. Thank you. Have a good have a good weekend everyone.